Without further ado, I would like to introduce the panelists joining us today. We have Anna Marie Bolino, the facilitator of fine arts and performing arts at Stafford County Public Schools. We also have Robin Lorenzen, district music and arts program manager at St. Paul Public Schools. And our wonderful moderator today, Greta Ryder, a customer success representative over at Smart Music. Greta, I will hand it off to you. Welcome. Let's start by introducing yourself. And can you each give us a little bit of a background of what you do in your classroom? Let's start with Anna Marie. Hi, Greta. Thanks. Good morning. And good morning to everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, so I'm Anna Marie Bellino and I supervise fine arts and music, theater, dance, drama, um, and visual art in Stafford County, Virginia. And our school division has about 30,000 students. Um, we start our music instruction in our elementary schools with general music and then our band and orchestra uh, programs start in the sixth grade when students select instruments. And then we also have a variety of other music um, courses like guitar and music technology. Um, we also have a world music class in our middle schools. So that's a little bit about me and our division. Our um, smart music implementation has actually been around for about 10 years, if not longer. And we have had all, we had originally all of our teachers using smart music and then different pockets of students would be using it depending on the teacher. And if the teacher wanted their students to use smart music, then we would actually, um, the school would pay or the teacher or the students would pay for the smart music subscriptions. But in the last couple of years, we've went to a division implementation. And so now we have full access for our band and our orchestra students, sixth to 12th grade and our teachers as well. And currently we are on um, the, um, the big mama of the software um, options. So they have the $20, I think, or maybe it's different, but um, they have the option that allows students to actually explore the solo repertoire and the library all on their own, which, so that's kind of the lens that I'm gonna bring to the conversation today um, in regards to our implementation. Great, thank you so much, Anna Marie. And Robin, can you please give us a little background about uh, you and what you do in your position? Yes, thank you, Greta. Um, I, good morning, everyone. I'm happy to be here today. And I am the, I serve as the district uh, K-12 music and arts program manager for St. Paul Public Schools in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. And I work directly with the music and arts educators, um, looking at innovative curriculum design, acqu acquisition of uh, new resources and facilitating professional development. So we work on creating and engaging culturally relevant music and arts opportunities for our students. Um, we advocate for uh, music, strong music and arts programming and really helping um, our community, our diverse community to uh, be seen and heard and connect uh, and, and feel that the music experiences are relevant to them. Um, in St. Paul Public Schools, we have about, uh, similar to Anna Marie's uh, district, we have around 34,000 students. Um, and we see, um, we start our music program in the daytime also in sixth grade. However, we do have an extended day uh, alternative education learning opportunity for students in fourth and fifth grade. And so they do get some instruction initially on instruments in fourth and fifth grade, uh, moving into then the middle schools. And we also have uh, started a summer program to also help those middle schoolers so they can kind of bump up a little bit before they get to middle school or while they're in middle school. And um, I, that seems to really help in their skill development as well. We too offer uh, music technology courses. We offer guitar, piano. Um, you know, we have the traditional band, choir, and orchestra. We have a music explorations course in middle school where uh, the teachers will look at uh, world music. They'll look at um, production technology. Uh, things like that to engage the students. Um, and we've been doing smart music now for since about 1917, or I'm sorry, 20, 2017. Uh, <laughs> and um, 2017. Uh, and we, um, you know, it, it was, we kind of did a tiered rollout where there's a soft rollout and a hard rollout. So there was a little bit of voice and choice for the, the teachers to decide. Um, 
you know, which they wanted to do. And we do provide for our high school level, we actually um, provide one-to-one -one license or subscriptions for them um, at the premier level. And then for our middle schools, we provide the standard level. Um, there are some schools that felt like the middle schools wanted the stand or the premier level over the standard. And so they found ways with their administrators or parent organizations to help and add and kind of bump up that level to the premier for some of the middle schools too. So I guess, you know, that's about it for right now. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you so much for that, Robin. Sure. And I will uh, drop in here for anyone listening, the subscription uh, structure for students has changed so that um, as of actually April 1st, all students have premium access to the library. So for the upcoming school year, um, all kiddos will have access to the, the library fully. Um, thank you so much for going into a little bit about your smart music implementations just from a higher level. Um, Robin, could we start with you? With um, Could you tell us what are the top two or three things you would tell an administrator who's just getting their district started with smart music? Sure. Um, well, I think one thing that's really important is to help with that, that um, teacher buy-in. So it's really important to include them in the conversation and not just make an administrative decision, we're gonna do this. Um, we had several meetings um, with teachers that wanted to have those conversations. We brought in data and information. Um, some of our teachers had had some experience with smart music, so that was helpful. So they came in with some experience and expertise and a little bit of information. Um, we also had um, representation from smart music themselves come in and talk with our teachers. And, and I um, had them I had connected with administrators above me as well to just kind of make sure we're all on the same page. And um, what really helped us was we are, are a one-to-one -one iPad district, so all of our students have iPads. And so there was this big push at that time to, you know, get more online resources. And so I think, and we, I had an administrator, director of our department at that time that was a musician himself and was, um, you know, all about technology and wanting to provide uh, equitable experiences for our students. So for us, um, equity was a big piece of that decision as well. And I think that um, having that, the, you know, considering the soft and the hard rollout, like I mentioned earlier, is like giving the, the teachers choice that first year and then let, allowing them, you know, saying, okay, the second year is going to be hard to roll out. So just prepare yourself and, you know, let's get everyone ready. So I think, and budgeting enough, being sure that you budget enough for the professional development, the support that the teachers might need, so. Great, thank you. Anna Marie, could you also expand on the top two or three things that you would tell an administrator who's just getting started with smart music in their district? Sure. So I would, um, I echo all, all of Robin's thoughts, the teacher buy-in, the structure. I would also add that I, at, at, our, at my level, I also worked on really getting my senior level leadership to understand the importance of the tool. So sharing that with my boss and her boss and our principals, because I, I, oftentimes, you know, some of the tech tools come with a heftier price tag, maybe than they're used to spending on arts education, right? And so I really wanted to explain to them how comprehensive the tool was and what our students would be able to do, what the impact would be um, as a result of implementing the tool. And not only just for our students, but also for our teachers, because there are tools in smart music that make it much more simple for teachers to grade and for students to get feedback and to access, you know, um, you know, the, the composition software and the method books and that sort of thing. So I would I would add on to that, um, that kind of that level of um, of item as well. Certainly, it sounds like you both found merit in um, not only discussing with your teachers, but getting getting people on on both sides of your equation, those above you and those um, that are, are working for you. Um, Anna Marie, zooming a bit in more on the teacher buy in side, were there any specific um, conversations or um, thoughts that you brought to your teachers specifically to get buy-in with them? 
Um, was so that honestly, a difficult process? Tell us more about that. Right. So that was really easy, actually, because they had been, many of them had been using it over the last 10 years. And so they already saw the value of smart music. And we've had, you know, multiple trainers come out over the years. We also are a finale school division. And so we've, um, you know, I see Lee is on the call. We've had many people come and present and share their knowledge knowledge with us. So our teachers really understood the value of smart music. And, you know, as we shifted this school year into, we were um, virtual for the first part of the year, and we didn't start seeing students face to face until February. And so um, with that, we were really able to um, over the summer, get our licenses for smart music, start diving in. And um, throughout the year, we've provided a lot of support for my office mostly, but then also the teachers meet weekly and they're sharing ideas. And we have, of course, um, we're a G Suite organization. So we've got all kinds of resources in which we share and collaborate together. And so it was actually pretty simple for us. We did have some new teachers, right, that we had to bring onto the fold and train and help them to understand the value. But I think that the fact that smart music, I don't work for smart music, but or make music, but the fact that it is a really robust platform, I think also makes it easy to generate um, buy-in from teachers. That's great. Sorry, had a trouble with the uh, unmute button there. That's great. Thank you so much, Anna Marie. It sounds like having teachers that are well-versed in the program can be quite the um, the help for teachers that are just either brand new to your district and how your district uses smart music or smart music itself. Um, Robin, could you also expand on that? How have you gained teacher buy-in to help smart music um, help your smart music implementation get off the ground in your district? Yeah. Yes, thank you, Greta. Um, very similar to Anna Marie in some respects um, in terms of uh, there was a lot of buy-in because some of our teachers had been using it prior, but we did have, I would say maybe 25-30% that really weren't interested in it initially because it's like that's not what I do and it's not what I'm used to and I'm comfortable with what I do. So um, we really did have to have supports in place to help guide them and show help them see the value of it. Um, so we, I actually put in our budget for about two to three years, I think it was, that where we had professional development uh, leaders that would actually, you know, kind of hold the hand and walk, you know, side by side with the teacher to help them get established in, uh, and comfortable with their technology skills. It was usually around the technology skills and a lot of, of a lot of times. So, um, and then we also had to just look at what it was that, that caused them to be a little bit more resistant. Um, and was it the, was it the tech skills? Was it that they like what they do, as I mentioned, or was it like biases about, well, my students aren't gonna be able to navigate this or they're not gonna like it. So we had to really just explore the biases that might've been around that. Um, and I think that, um, having the, those things in place and then also encouraging teachers when they were doing their uh, professional learning communities or PL use smart music. And so then again, they're in smaller groups of teachers and they're, they're able to um, explore it and get support from each other. So I think that was really a critical piece for them. Certainly, great answer, great answer. Thank you. Um, Robin, I am um, going to dive in a little bit deeper with that. Could you um, expand on in any ways that you've helped your teachers get themselves settled in smart music so they're ready to start using it, but um, perhaps you know they, they hit an obstacle along the way or they're really um, amped about using it at first and, and then you know the school year gets underway and we've got all sorts of things that, that we're dealing with at that point. Um, how, how do you help teachers sustain using smart music as a tool throughout the semester and throughout the school year? Yeah, well, you know, we have uh, professional development that we do um, at the, like in our opening week time. And so initially I would have a lot of sessions around smart music and I would actually ask smart music to come in and do some uh, webinars with us. And so they, it was great. They would come together and it was an opportunity for them both to learn more about smart music, to go dive a little bit deeper with it, or to problem solve any problems that they might be having. And I will say, we also, there were times when um, the teachers would be concerned because the kids would get frustrated due to the kind of the rigor of 
correctness or accuracy needed to not get red, you know, marks and things like that. And so we would have conversations with Smart Music about it. And they were very responsive and, you know, helped us look at some things that we could um, kind of adjust or, or, you know, ways we could um, communicate with teachers and the students about it. And I think that one thing that has been really helpful is even though the grading is really great in Smart Music and it gives that immediate feedback, which I think is so valuable, um, it is up to the teacher to be the, the final grader, you know? And so I think once they kind of kept hearing that, you know, like this is just, a, a, you know, an, op an opportunity, a platform for students to get that immediate feedback so they can kind of see what the trends are for them and not feel like, oh my gosh, I, I did terrible, I'm gonna get a terrible grade. And so I think it was really important for teachers to see that they still had, you know, the the you know ability to make the determination on what level the student was at and where their needs were. Uh, and so using it hand in hand, really. Um, and so then we would have those, those uh, webinars or those professional development opportunities. And then if questions came up throughout the year and I would check in with the teachers periodically, how is it going? Or we'd have the PLC meetings um, or we'd have a professional development day and I would check in. And um, again, I would pair up the lead teachers, our lead teachers that really were kind of experts in smart music with the teachers that were not and kind of have a partnership of mentoring them around it. And I think that was really beneficial. And I still have some lead teachers that will pop in and support those teachers that maybe need some help at this time. Nice, that sounds excellent. Yeah, it's uh, it's sometimes a matter of, of supporting the teachers and sometimes a matter of supporting the teachers in their supporting of the students. Absolutely. So it take, takes a little, little investigative work. Anna Marie, could you expand on anything um, in, in that realm, you know, in what ways have you helped your teachers get themselves settled in smart music once you've launched the program? I think that um, beyond the things that Robin said, which I 100% concur with, um, so my teachers do sometimes talk about the harshness of the feedback, just because it's so set, right? It's, you know, the algorithms. Um, and so making sure that the teachers are the final and, and helping give kids that positive. We talk a lot about that, like, the students as the while the platform is a tool it is just that it's a tool and so um and so we have to teach our students how to use the tool and if the tool doesn't do exactly what we need it to do then you know getting them through that phase of oh okay and that's where the conversation between the teacher and the student is so important i think that one of the things that we are working through as we come back into the classroom setting during the pandemic is how do we use smart music now that we're back? So we've got the full scale version, which we hadn't had before. And we used it first in the fall when we were fully remote. And so we really relied on smart music. We used a lot of the features to have assignments for individual work or for solo repertoire work. We accessed repertoire. Um, of course, the sight reading component in there is, super, is superb. So now what we're trying to do is figure out how to help them balance how once we're back, what, because now that we're back in that setting, they don't want to use the digital tools in the classroom because they really just want to get back to making music together in the setting, which I completely understand. That's what we do. And so now we're shifting to how we can embed it into our assignments, into our assessment strategies, so that our students can still have that sort of personalized approach, right? Um, but we've still got a balance between the instructional setting, which may or may not use the tools of smart music often versus um, how they can use them individually to monitor progress, monitor, um, you know, give and receive feedback, um, as well as do some embedding into the classroom. So that's probably our growth now as we kind of continue through the pandemic, right? Certainly. And I think that's uh, a great point to address too, is as we in varying ways across the country and on across, across the globe, transition back into in-person teaching. That is, of course, the thing that teachers and their students want to jump back into. It's like, okay, now we can be in the same room. Now we can make music together. And it's a, it can be um, a bit of an adjustment to figure out, okay, well, smart music, now I'm going to be using it as maybe an instructional tool or an assessment tool and not as a complete structure for my entire class period. It's it's more of 
figuring, okay, well, it did the heavy lifting over there before, but now that the landscape looks different, in what other ways can it do the heavy lifting so I can focus on making the music, making the memories with my students? That's an excellent point. Um, and then, Anna Marie, could you uh, then go into how has smart music helped your musicians and your teachers stay connected during recent periods of remote and or hybrid um, instruction settings? So I think that one of the most natural things was just for the teachers to have a platform to hear kids' assessments, right? So kids would submit recordings of themselves um, after the teacher would maybe assign something um, so that we could really hear how kids were doing, how they were growing during that remote time. Um, we also felt like just having some normalcy. So we weren't sending home paper copies of anything uh, because we didn't know where the virus was and how long it lived and all of those things. And so having the repertoire available, um, the teachers really felt like it kind of provided some normalcy. We couldn't play the repertoire together, but we could, we had our own structures for how we could you know, share the, you know, share what was kind of happening and, and what the part sounded like and look at different parts. So that was actually really cool too, right? If I'm the, if I'm the flute one player, um, I never got to see what the trumpet part looked like. And so it opened up this whole new world for kids with score study and just even knowing where they fit into the structure of the score um, or what's happening in a particular section of music and what their role is in that section. That was actually really cool. And I hope that as we come back in, um, as we're back in, that we look at that, you know, and how we can embed that work in that that's in smart music into the classroom setting, um, because it's it's easier to do it that way than making a, a handout for every one of all of the pieces, right? So I would say that that was pretty darn cool. And then the other thing that I think for us was different was for kids to have access to the solo and ensemble repertoire. And so for us, we explored a whole different way of looking at um, individual growth or chamber music, because often we would only focus on chamber music in a particular part of the year. And we wouldn't necessarily have all of the vast um, literature available to us. And so often we would have teachers do some assigning or um, we would have, especially we could differentiate very easily for our upper level students. And we could say, all right, you know where you are. So we want you to look and we want you to pick three or four pieces. And we actually could start seeing how students perceived themselves as players um, and their skill level, you know, we could see if they were able to select pieces that were within their, you know, their zone of proximal development, or if they were reaching for the stars because they didn't really have a clue. And so having that repertoire was really, really interesting. Um, and I think actually really helped support our students in their goal setting in a new and innovative way, which uh, you know, I think we all were trying to be innovative and creative during this time to keep kids engaged. And that was a great way that we did that. All right, so those are my two, I'm going to give those two big things and then I'm going to turn over to Robin. I'm sure she'll add on. Yeah, Robin, please add in um, how Smart Music has helped your musicians and teachers stay connected, both, you know, musician to musician and teacher to teacher, but teacher to musician as well. Right. I, I mean, I totally echo what Anna Marie um, is saying. And um, I think that it really, when the pandemic hit, and since we'd had, you know, we we're kind of solidly using the smart music, it really made that transition, you know, as seamless as possible um, for instrumentalists and our district and the students. And I think that the, um, you know, actually what was, I think, surprising to some of the teachers was some of the students actually flourished more in that setting because they had that more individualized, as Anna Marie was talking about. And um, so it was more individualized. It was more, I think they had to take ownership of their experience in learning uh, in terms of being, you know, less passive and more, you know, the independent learner um, that we hope that they will be. And I think that the, we've just now started going back into uh, in-person learning the last few weeks. And um, I'm hearing really positive things from the teachers that you know, the kids are not as behind as they anticipated they would be. So, and I think it was really due to the opportunity of having smart music. 
um, over the, the course of this uh, pandemic. So, and I, I know that they will continue to use smart music and now see, maybe even value it more than they did prior um, and seeing how they can kind of uh, merge both that and, and blend that, have more of a blended learning approach to their instruction um, so that it's uh, blended with the virtual as well as our, or the you know, online resources as well as their in-person opportunities. Um, and I will say also that I think for the teachers, it really gave them a chance to start exploring uh, smart music. So I think a lot of them were using it much more basically. And because they were given time within their structure of their schedule, the teachers um, to do more like lesson creation and all this, because it was all so new and trying to create the virtual. And so their teachers were given more time. Um, I think they were able to d dive deeper into what they can do in smart music. And I heard from several teachers that they went more into like some of the composition and how can they um, upload uh, pieces that they have um, purchased from other places, you know, to have so we would have uh, composers of color in there and, and more variety. And, and so I think that they took that advantage of that opportunity to just really um, hone their own skills with smart music. That's great to hear. Thank you for um, both of your insights on that. Well, we've, we've uh, kind of zoomed in down to the teacher to student and teacher to teacher level. Let's take a step back here. And um, Robin, can you start for us if, um, how and if smart music has helped you as an administrator fight for your music programs, maintain student engagement from your position and gain visibility into that engagement. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, well, I, you know, as I mentioned, I think when COVID hit, the value was even, seen even to be greater than prior to this. And so, with, so the students were not able to lose momentum. And we were hearing all around the country that, oh my gosh, we have to stop band, we've got to stop, you know, orchestra, choir, we can't do it virtually. And, um, you know, we had the tools and the resources through smart music and were able to do that. And then I think that was, um, you know, appreciated by our upper levels of, of administration and, and district level people so that they um, saw that we were already, you know, ready and the momentum was there to keep going with it all. So I think that was really helpful. Um, I also think that for us um, having smart music, um, in the middle and high school has been helpful to maybe bridge a little bit of the um, disparities that happen in, in terms of equity, because a lot of our kids cannot afford uh, lessons. And so if they can't afford lessons, they don't get kind of that, that more, um, you know, individualized opportunities. So with smart music, they can use it at home, they can connect with their teachers. Um, on a more individualized basis. And I, I, so for us, we've we also used it in our district's um, values and it works really highly around equity work that we're doing in our district. Um, so I think that it's valued that way as well because of that. Um, and we, we have actually a kind of a multi-departmental buy-in because um, it's, you know, we use it out of the Office of Teaching and Learning for the daytime program, <clears throat> but it's also supported through the alternative learning um, education um, areas because we start our, our elementary music programs uh, in the fourth and fifth grade, as I mentioned, through our ALC programming um, and funding. And then it, the, actually it's our personalized learning and technology department that funds it. So it's like everyone's kind of got to be on the table and talk about it. And so it's important to have kind of some of the data and the research and um, proving to them the importance and um, the buy-in is there. So it, it's been really um, helpful in that way. So, you know, having a district that is doing one-to-one -one sees the value of having these kinds of um, resources for the kids that are, you know, have such great integrity, integrity, I'm sorry, integrity and quality um, has been very um, uh, great for all the um, content areas. So for instance, you know, a lot of times there's a lot of focus on the math and literacy, as we know. <laughs> and um, so I think that um, seeing value with these kind of tools being um, respected and um, valued in our district has been really helpful. And I haven't really had too much trouble around having to um, show that other than just having the conversations, I think, mostly. 
That's great. Sounds like it, it makes those conversations smoother than may, maybe would have been in the first place. Yeah. Anna Marie, can you um, expand on that again, you know, in how and and if smart music has helped you from your position as, as an admin to fight through music programs, uh, maintain student engagement and gain visibility yourself and other parties into that student engagement? So I'm going to start with the engagement and work backwards because I actually think that smart music really helped. I mean, first of all, let me just say that a teacher is has to be the most engaging, right? It's it's up to the teacher to make the tools engaging for kids, right? So I, I firmly believe the teacher is the number one person in the classroom um, that supports engagement and enrollment numbers and all of those things. That being said, um, the way that they use tools like smart music are really important. And so um, my teachers this year have really used smart music to build that engagement. And that tool has been such an important part of student engagement because it was it was really hard at first for kids to be engaged in the work. And, and our teachers really, I mean, they're doing completely different work or they were doing completely different work. And so um, smart music really helped us create a community where um, we could use repertoire from the platform and we would, um, several of my teachers, of course, would do very basic things with it, but things that really engaged kids like playing the song and then the kids would sing along, right, the, or, or would perform along. And so the kids felt like they were a part of the band because they were hearing the other parts. And that alone, just trying to keep kids connected to the music and the work of their peers was really important in maintaining the engagement um, for kids. And, um, and, and I think that there's a really, of course, strong connection between engagement and recruitment and retention and enrollment numbers. And I know that across the nation, um, Robin and I and our colleagues are concerned about our arts, our music enrollment numbers. We're concerned that kids aren't going to come back or um, scheduling practices or recovery and, uh, and of learning, you know, efforts are going to force students to have to select remediation courses or they're just they don't think music is a place for them anymore because it wasn't fun last year because it wasn't really what they used to do right so i think that that connection of engagement to the enrollment and the recruitment and the retention numbers is key for us because we want we, we know we're going to take a little hit from the pandemic but we're trying to use that uh that great engagement that teachers are doing in the classroom with their students and getting back to the you know continuing the community and then rebuilding it so that our enrollment numbers will start to flourish and kind of rebound over the next couple years and so showing that students are engaged in both the virtual instruction and then also are back to you know, in-person instruction is really key and for me helping to fight for the program. So yeah, so it shrunk just a little bit, but look at the engagement of the kids. And so that engagement will aid us in recruitment and retention. Cause when we've got really, when we've got engaged kids, then we know that they're going to go out and do the recruiting for us because band is fun and look at all of the innovative, cool things that my teacher is doing. We love band. We love orchestra. We love music. So come and join us. Right. Um, so I think that that connection right between engagement and enrollment just is really important. Certainly, certainly. Yeah, it's a it's a matter of if you can keep those students engaged and assist your teachers in having those students engaged, the students will go out and, and as you said, recruit, recruit for you. You maybe have to send a couple emails, put up a couple flyers here and there, but getting getting the students jazz is, is the big, the big um, helpful part. Um, well, Anna Marie, I was wondering if for our last question, you'd start us off here. Um, and if you could tell us about any creative or unexpected ways that your district has used smart music, whether that's on a big scale or an individual teacher or certain students, anything about that. So it's interesting, you know, I'm not really sure what, what we think of when, when we think of what's creative and what's innovative. I mean, I will tell you that um, 
we are, we are doing a lot of presenting of student work. So often we'll work in smart music and then we'll have the kids download their audio and put it into a Google slide and create slide stacks. And we share that with the community, um, with the school community, with the greater community, with their principals, so that um, we can really continue to build that case for why, how we're using the platform and why we need the platform. Um, Cause it does of course come with a price tag. Um, one thing I did want to say that we, this is not really innovative or creative per se, but we love the, the movie music resources. There's just some really um, unique things in smart music alone that are really helping us um, to engage with kids. I would say um, that we've also um, honed in on how to make assignments um, worthwhile in smart music. So we may say, okay, kids, we want you to go in and just look for this particular genre of music. Um, or we want you to pick three different pieces um, and from different genres. So, you know, we're trying to build students just sense of, of exploration, but also if they're kind of stuck in their way, getting them to expand their musical horizons too. So, and we also, of course, are trying to tie in that fine music from different cultures, right? Or find something that you've never heard before or heard of, um, because we want to, of course, build their skill set and we want to build that, um, just that, you know, that culturally responsive piece, but also the diversity. Um, the, diver the diverse repertoire that's out there, make sure, making sure that they're really accessing that. Um, and I would say too, um, like the composition feature, right? So the teachers are using it to create their own warm ups or twisters for kids. So um, our teachers are really striving to be creative in the platform as well as creative with their lesson planning. And, um, and I, you know, that brings me great joy because I know that that's not always a skill set that some of our teachers bring from, you know, from their previous experiences. So seeing the teachers actually um, be vulnerable and take risks and do new things makes me happy, right? As, as, a, as a professional development expert and as, you know, their pseudo supervisor, I want to see them growing just like teachers want kids to grow, right? Absolutely. That's all wonderful to hear. Thank you so much for going into that. Robin, can you expand on any creative or unexpected ways that your district has used smart music? Yeah, I mean, I think we've been doing some similar things as Anna Marie's um, district. I mentioned earlier the composition piece too. I think it's, that's been a really interesting way. It's been, hasn't been, um, I don't think we've done as much um, as a district, but I've been checking in with teachers to ask what they've been doing. And I think that um, they, you know, that putting in the composition, whether it be um, a you know, warm up exercise or whether it be a composition themselves or whether it be taking student compositions and, and uploading those into there and then sharing that for their colleague, you know, their, their fellow students to play and have that opportunity. Um, I, and then also the, I think the uploading of, um, you know, like newer works that maybe aren't in method books or in your library um, so that we have, you know, like so that students can see composers, whether it's a Hmong composer or an African-American composer, they can see um, and learn more about and have opportunity to perform those kinds of pieces as well and bringing that into um, getting permission, obviously it's important to get permission from those composers before doing that. So you actually, you know, have that agreement with them that you can put it in there and use it. So that's a, an important piece with that. Um, and I think also um, what we have done on a broader district um, wide uh, scale for our uh, cross district PLC is we have um, used smart music, as I mentioned earlier, to look at student development and and teacher growth for that matter and how they're using smart music so that they can uh, connect with each other and, and help each other to grow in that area. Um, and then I think um, the score analysis has also been really good. I think as Anna Marie was talking about um, looking, you know, having the, the students actually delve, dive into what is in there, you know, what, what are, what's available to us beyond what our teachers assign us. And then, or the teacher bringing forth a, a certain um, score and saying, let's analyze this. What is, what is composition about? What, what pieces do we see in this composition versus this, you know, another composition? So I think that's been a, a really exciting, um, opportunity as well. 
Wonderful. I love to hear it. Um, we are nearing the end of our session here. Anna Maria, I do have a question that was asked a while back um, during the uh, your answer about how um, smart music has helped musicians and teachers stay connected. And I think um, I'll, I'll read it here for you. It's but I would love if this question was a point of conversation also in the post session um, community board chat for both attendees and other other administrators as well as other teachers to explore this question. So uh, I, it says, we've got a question from Joseph Sosa asking, how did you have students play chamber music while fully online? Um, once they were finished with the piece, did they do a digital performance? I think you mentioned that they were accessing solo and ensemble, chamber, chamber music, et cetera. We did. So um, we, we actually didn't do much of this. Um, I think it was only one school, but we also have some, um, soundtrack. And so we did a little bit of, of, of recording in that capacity. And so we did have kids play the chamber music um, and really kind of get a sense, right? And work through what that was like and their parts. And also it created that, um, that small group connection with kids. And then we did do some recording projects and soundtrack in that around the chamber music. Great, thanks for clarifying. I will be sure to, um, as I said, I'll throw that in our community board. So if anyone hops over there after the session and, and would like to continue the conversation there, we certainly can. Um, well, thank you so much, Anna Marie and Robin for having this lovely conversation. I'm gonna hand it over to Michaela for the end of our session here. Thank you so much for joining us, both Anna Marie and Robin. And thank you for Greta for moderating as well. We will see you at the top of the hour for our next live sessions. Thank you.